circulation and apartment addiction. Housing. Just by him, they in the top 20% was black and completing all tests except for the audiology test because he is dead. I will let him explain what he has been doing since then to bring awareness to Congress and the push for a demonstration program for deaf and hard of hearing Americans to serve in the armed forces. Please welcome Keith Moulton. the 
feeling without taking the pill. So I was starting to internalize that belief system that deaf people or people with hearing loss are not able to serve in the military. So I thought, well, if I can't hear, I can't hear. But then once again, my dad inspired me too. My dad was uh, the, the, the first deaf born politician and he served in the city council for Northampton, Massachusetts. And he became an experienced politician and he overcame many barriers along the way to be successful in this. He wrote a book called From Obstacles to Political Victory. So I saw his journey and that inspired my belief. And then further on, I was able to go to Israel and that inspired me as well. What I saw in Israel was while I was there visiting a friend for three weeks, um, I was able to interview 10 different deaf Israel so Israeli soldiers. Interestingly, the Israel Defense Force allows deaf people to serve fully. And I thought, well, how can this be? And what I learned was that, oh, and yes, I can just hear on the platform, yes. So what I learned was um, deaf people can serve in the military in a variety of supporting roles. Um, they have deaf and hard of hearing military service personnel in a variety of roles. And so when I met with them, I asked them what kind of work they did. And they said, well, we do whatever works. They said, we do slip reading, we do signing, we do hearing aids, we use adaptive technology, cochlear implants, all kinds of adaptive approaches, whatever works within the organization, which is exactly what Alda does. Whatever works, works. So that's what Alda does. And I saw your website, and that reminds me of what you do here, and it brought to mind the things that I saw in Israel. You remember I mentioned the 10 soldiers that I interviewed? Two of them were working with the American military. Yeah. And that really impacted me. Why can't deaf and hard of hearing Americans serve in the military if those Israeli soldiers with hearing loss could work with deaf American soldiers? Why can't American deaf soldiers do the same? So I tried again, and this time I tried to get into the Army. I was very fortunate in that I was in the right time, in the right place, and with the right people. So I was able to get into the Army ROTC program through CSUN. I trained with them for two years, and I did very well. I'm not going to expand uh, the details very much with you because that information is available on my TED Talk through available online. But I was uh, top 20% in my class, and during the first two years of the four-year ROTC program, I did very well. And when it was time for me to be promoted to my third year, it required that I contract with the Army and go through an audiology exam. And that was one test that I simply could not pass. So my officers tried to get me a waiver, but we did not have success with that. So they said, your only recourse is to go to Congress and ask for a waiver. And I've been working on that for the past eight years. So let's go back to the very beginning. The Department of Defense policy regarding hearing loss states that if anyone has a degree of hearing loss, they are disqualified from military service. So if you notice the provision at the very bottom says even if a person has a history of having used a hearing aid, they would be disqualified. Also, if someone has had a cochlear implant, they would be disqualified. So here's a poster advertising that information. Now I've had soldiers come up to me and tell me, well, they know of people who have served in the military who use hearing aids and use different types of disability supports and are on active duty. So I asked, how can that be? And I haven't been able to get a straight answer, but what I've heard through the grapevine are two basic arguments. The first of those two arguments is 
that if someone is in the military and has lost their hearing, that they suffer a loss, and that the military support system owes them because of that loss. The second argument is the Department of Defense has poured resources and money into training for that officer or for that service personnel, and they don't want those resources to be wasted. So I think those points make sense to me, and I can completely respect those arguments. However, it still doesn't mean that someone who is an American with hearing loss couldn't serve in the same way, that couldn't provide effective duty despite their hearing loss. through 2013. There were over 300,000 active service members with hearing loss. That is a lot of people. In fact, hearing loss is the number one disability expressed in the military services. So there you have it. The Department of Defense actually promotes this information. And I want to let you know that hearing loss is not, is not only experienced from gunfire or from explosions, it can also be from working in loud environments, from working around helicopters and other noise pollution. <coughs> there was one article written about a person in um, military service who had hearing loss because they were working on a computer that was located very close to a generator and the noise caused hearing loss. I was at Walter Reed Military Hospital in Maryland. Um, there I was participating in the celebration of their audiology department anniversary, and that had been 60 years celebration. While there, they were trying to do some fundraising to do research with regard to hearing loss and also um, how that was impacted by soldiers who served in um, loud and air, um, served in areas where their, their hearing was impacted and I told them, well, we have a, a deaf person that I know who, who just graduated from the Citadel, which is a military school. This is his picture. This school is in South Carolina. His name is Ethan, and he has a cochlear implant. He can use a phone, and um, he cannot access military service because of his hearing loss. And so this is a good point of research. And I said, why don't you invite him into your research program? And they said, well, he can't because he's a citizen. He is not military personnel. And I thought, what, what a waste that he could actually participate in the program. Here and 
this is part of the tour of that National Geospatial Agency Park. I know there are many demonstration programs within the military, and this is related to hearing loss. In Florida School for the Deaf and Blind, there's this program here. And this particular person is legally deaf and legally blind. And still they are able to serve in the Army. And I said, well, that's great for you. How did they overcome this barrier without going through the congressional approval? What rules did they apply for that? And how can we access that process? And they said they couldn't tell me um, how they got around the rules. It was private. As we explore this issue more and more, I've gotten support from a variety of different communities, including this one. This gentleman is a drill sergeant in Fort Jackson, and he's on video signing as part of his <laughs> drill sergeant leadership activities. And the video went viral with millions of viewers. He's a co-instructor, and his name is David Alexander. He was in the Army for 12 years as a Black Hawk helicopter pilot, and now he's an audiologist. But he's very, very supportive, and he believes that the program for deaf and hard of hearing Americans in the military should move forward as a model program. We had three bills that were introduced in the last eight years in the Senate and two in the House. Perhaps you know the Senator Tom Harkin. Yes. I'm sure you're familiar with him from Iowa. He's a large supporter of the community, of the deaf community, and he was able to introduce one bill, but unfortunately, he's no longer in Congress. He's since retired. For the House side, we had a congressman Mark Catano from California, who's a staunch supporter of the bill, and he supported two of our bills. Unfortunately, those were standalone bills, and they never made it out of the Senate or the House committee. The Congress did receive hundreds of standalone bills that are ultimately rejected. So we try 
a different strategy. There was a bill called the, the National Defense Authorization Act. And that is the bill that needs to be passed by Congress every year or the funds aren't appropriated for the military. So we added a provision into that bill and we tried to put it into the NDAA for 2018 authorization, which would then go in effect in 2019. And the House put it in. I was thrilled with it. We were one half of the way through the process. It was a great moment. And we just were waiting for the final bill to go through the Senate. And then the conference committee in July of 2018, unfortunately, the provision was deleted from the bill. And we had to find out why. In this photograph, this is what we call the big four. And the one in the middle is Matt Thornberry from Texas. He was the chairman from the House Armed Services Committee. And with him is Adam Smith from Washington State. And the ranking member of the House, the House Armed Services Committee. And I'll just give you the well, the facts that now though, this is a role for these four individuals has been reversed because the House was taken over by the Democrats in January 2019. But I know that the House put this in their bill and they didn't remove it. And they're, and they're in the Senate. The man on the left Senator in Hockey from Oklahoma. Actually was supposed to be Senator McCain. He was the chairman of the committee, but unfortunately he was ill and not well at the time, and he's recently passed away, as you know. Senator in Hockey took his place. And then Senator Reed from Rhode Island is also there. I reached to, out to their offices and they referred me to their staffer, the staffers of the committee. So I went and sat down with them last August, August of 2018. staff were really blunt and direct and they told me that they didn't support the provision and that they were the ones who removed it. Now, I'm glad that they admitted that in that setting, but then I had been working on this for eight years trying to get something through the house and I did it and only for them to take it out. They said that there were three reasons why they wanted this provision removed. The first one because they thought that there'd be a risk for service members. And if the deaf and hard of hearing individuals were put in the service, that there'd be risk for everyone involved. And that argument is a valid one. It makes sense. And that's the reason why we, why we asked for a demonstration project to check and see if that was a valid one. Reason or not. Now, in the looking back on it, I wish I had mentioned that at the time, because what I would have brought up is this fact. Women in service. Do you remember Edith Rogers? She proposed that women, the Women's Army Corps, or the WAC, which was instilled in World War II. And at that time, they used the same argument. They said it was too dangerous for women to serve. But yet, 
where are women now in the service? They're integrated in every aspect of the military. The second argument they had was they felt that deaf and hard of hearing individuals would be deployable, that they would have to stay within the United States, and it would disrupt the rotation of those that did get deployed. I was disappointed with that. <coughs> because the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency up on the hill, we had we have known that they have deployed deaf and hard of hearing individuals of abroad through the intelligence agency. They were overseas, they were working. They vetted and ate with military service members that were deployed. So it showed that deaf and hard of hearing people could be deployed. And once more, the NGA is under the Department of Defense. So we do have a president already sent. The third argument they had is that they felt we would need interpreters accompanying us all the time. Obviously, I don't need to tell you that, that we don't need interpreters with us all the time. <coughs> we may need interpreters for formal meetings and training, naturally. But all day, shadowing us? No, we've got ways to communicate with our colleagues. I didn't have an interpreter all the time with me when I was in the ROTC. But if they really wanted to talk about interpreters, and that interpreters would need to be accompanying us all the time. And if you're talking about interpreters, when they deploy service people abroad, they have interpreters all the time accompanying them to communicate with their foreign allies and friends. during that meeting, I was really disappointed when I left. And this year, in 2019, we weren't successful in getting the provision reinstated in any bill. With the House, we would have to start all over again within the House to initiate a bill and bring it through the, the conference committee. Now, Tom Tillett from North Carolina, he had a unique idea. I don't know if you're aware, right now we have five branches of military service, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Coast Guard. It's possible that we may be developing a sixth branch, U.S. Space Force. It hasn't been implemented yet, but it's in the process of being considered. Perhaps we could read, write some language. And Senator Tullett wrote language saying that to reduce barriers for service in the Space Force, perhaps we could add a third. So that was an idea they had. And because if they're setting up a new branch, while they're setting up the regulations for this branch, perhaps we could get in on the ground floor. But it's gonna take time and a lot of work. I need your support. If you can, if you can let your congressman know that you're in support of this idea, please do. And if you're a member, or if you know someone that's in the Veteran Services Organization, it'd be helpful if they <coughs> could send a letter as well. I'm looking at your, or I looked at your previous presentation, and there was someone that you had that presented here, Lieutenant Alan Ford, from 2012. He was here at your AltaCon. And he was talking about how hard it was difficult, how difficult it was for veterans that experienced hearing loss. I 
like to experience a similar thing, a disconnect between veterans with hearing loss and the deaf and hard of hearing community. Because they lost something, or maybe it's because the quality of life. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. former army wife. I lost my hearing and they um, fitted me with hearing aids. 
When I walked into that room, I was the only African-American female in that room. It was all men. They was there for hearing tests. There was people in that room with hearing aids. Active duty. And I'm like, what is this? When I spoke with the colonel, the colonel said, you can go civilian or you can go military. I said, I'll keep you. I didn't want the audiologist. There was young men there and they said to me, they said, at least you got a choice. They didn't want the audiologist like me. I said, you have some control over that. I said, she is civilian contractor. Floating around the base, seeing people in there. I know for a fact, I saw people working in support position, active duty, with hearing aids in their ear. Because I was one of the only wives walking around that base with hearing aids on. And I said, I told my husband, I said, ex-husband now, but I said, I know they not putting them out. You know why they don't want you in there? They want you to pass tests to get in, and then when you get in there, they destroy your hand. And that was one of the things that is um, promised that they had a whole lot of men, like those pictures of women you're showing, they get them in there and they destroy their hand. I worked with veterans and stuff, like in federal jobs and stuff, and there was just one man in particular. He wanted hearing aids. He said, well, I want to put a few years in the military. We went to this thing and they tell him all this stuff. And he talked to me. I said, no, they're not going to pay for it. I said, but if you've been in the military, I said, go over to our VA. I said, if you can connect that some way to service injury, blah, blah, blah. Because my husband worked on tanks. And I mean, those shells, they put out some D-bells. Those tanks, I mean, them D-bells off the chart. And they think that. They mess you up, they put you out, or they want to put you out. But they want you to come in with pitch perfect hearing, and then they destroy it. Thank you. Yep, there you have it. Thank you for sharing. Hi, I'm Kim. I just wanted to mention Hong Kong the military doesn't put <coughs> us as an aspect to them. If I think about it, I'm a lip reader with over 50 years of experience. I can hear them behind glass. I would be an asset to anybody who can't communicate, that can't hear, but I can hear you. And those who sign, think of us as an asset. You stop because you can communicate better than hearing people can. Stop can't, just go to mom. And I also work for the Drug Enforcement and with the FBI. I would look at videos and why not think about it. Be smart. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I hope you don't mind uh, personal question. How, how old are you and does the military have a like age out where you can go into the military if you're mm -hmm. too old? The cutoff age for the Air Force is 20, 28. I'm sorry, 38. The cutoff age for the Air Force is 38. And I'm 37 now. Have one year to go. So yes, my so question, uh, I talked to you. Oh, wait, there are two at the same time. Okay, sure. Thank you so much for coming here and presenting. I am the mother of the second female inducted into the United States Infantry. And she is a psychology major. She gets oh. out in, uh, I think, the second week of January. She said it would not be appropriate while she's still in service to um, write about and share her experience as one of the first female infantry. She was a tank commander as well as a scout, so she was dual certified. Um, However, wow. you may want to consider reaching out to those initial 13 females that were inducted 
because I suspect that maybe um, their experience um, would be something that we can learn from as deaf individuals wanting to enter into the military. Well, yeah, I'm impressed. Wow, and thank her for her service and for you as her daughter. I took a class last year about Parkland and policy making. I graduated last April. And as part of that training, you learn that you can contact your congressman, your local law enforcement, I mean, all the way up to the Supreme Court. And I want to remind everybody it's an election year, and if enough people make enough noise about a certain issue, then maybe, just maybe, we can get something changed. This 2019 is ridiculous that we are still having to fight for every single thing it seems like in the world. So I want to thank Katie for coming. Thank you. And if anybody else has any more questions, 